How long was gas street lights in use in Mitcham? I'd always thought of gas street lights to do with Victorian London, Sherlock Holmes, that sort of thing. But it seems that gas street lights were in use up to the 1960s. This video is going to be in two parts. The first part answers this question. The second part tells how the gas was made at the Mitcham Gas Works. You don't have to watch the whole video, of course. And in fact, I've seen from the statistics of viewing habits of my videos that a lot of people give up after a short period of time. They probably think, oh no, this is really boring. And they switch off. But if you do find such things interesting, I suggest you continue watching. Because in part two, I'll be going into a bit more detail. Anyway, here's part one. The question is, how long was gas street lights in use in Mitcham. Now, where I grew up, which was in a housing estate built in the early 1950s, the street lights were electric to start with. I don't recall, as a child, actually seeing any gas street lights. So during the 60s, I guess, a number of these things had already been replaced. Going through newspaper archives at the local study centre at Morden Library, I came across this article from 27th of November 1959. Better street lighting, it said. And it gave a list of the streets. And I'm showing you here on the screen. Quite a few streets were going to be converted from gas to electric. One in particular is of interest, Commerside East. It has in brackets, Tamworth Villas. It's of interest because the Merton Historical Society put in their, their latest bulletin an inquiry from a grandmother now living in Australia, who's been writing her memoirs for her grandchildren, and she wanted to clarify or confirm that uh, where she was living, at number 319, Commerside East, that there were actually gas lights in the street. And as it happens, she referred to 1959. The article, the newspaper article, shows Commerside East, in brackets, Tamworth Fillers, and Tamworth Villas includes number 319. So, so yes, the Merton Historical Society can respond to her request and say, you're correct, there was still gas lights in 1959 in Commerside East, where you lived. Now, we know that the gas works at Mitcham and Western Road stopped producing town gas in 1960. The street lights were being supplied by gas from that gas works doesn't mean that all the gas street lights were turned off at that time because those gas holders were still used to store gas produced by other gas works around South London, Croydon, etc. So we don't know for sure, but the answer to the question is possibly the early 1960s up to the mid or late 1960s. Now for part two. In part two, I'm going to go into a bit more detail. To start with, what was this gas? How was it made? Where did it come from? Well, it was being made at the gas works, as I said. As far as Mitcham was concerned, the Mitcham gas works at Western Road. As to how the gas is actually made from coal, I'm going to make use of an article from 1933 from the local paper, the Mitcham News and Mercury. I'm going to use an AI voice to read out the article text itself, but I'll interrupt it at various points with my own comments. The manufacture of gas was the subject of a very interesting address given at the weekly meeting of the Rotary Club of Mitcham, held on Monday at the White Hart Hotel, Mitcham. The speaker was Rotarian Edward Pellew Harvey of the Wandsworth and District Gas Company and a member of the Mitcham Club, and he explained that the art of coal gas manufacture is considerably over a century old. After dealing with the history of the production of coal, he said that at the present time in the United Kingdom alone, there are some 1,700 separate concerns promoted for the manufacture of gas. Of these, 931 are operated under statutory powers, some 619 being owned by companies and 313 by local authorities. The capital employed by the statutory concerns is approximately £140 million. 
the total annual production of gas in the United Kingdom is approximately 300,000 million cubic feet, which is distributed to 8 million individual consumers through 40,000 miles of street mains. The following is briefly, he added, the process of gas making. The coal is placed in numerous hermetically sealed fire clay or silica containers called retorts, which are heated to a temperature of approximately 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit by a mixture of furnace gas and air which circulates round the retorts. There is practically no limit to the number of retorts used. At the Mitcham Works, there are 192 working continually, each retort containing 1,200 weight of coal, which remains in the retort for 12 hours after which all the gas has been extracted from the coal and approximately 900 weight of coke left. Another charge is placed in the retort, which again remain for a period of 12 hours. From the foregoing figures it will be seen that, at the Mitcham works approximately 200 tonnes of coal per day are used for gas production. And how did all this coal get to Mitcham, you might ask? Well, there were ships employed by the gas companies, such as this one, the MV Mitcham. The largest and most up-to-date of the flat iron colliers, seen here on the end of a voyage from the northern coalfields, the mast and funnel of the Mitcham telescope into the hull, thus enabling her to negotiate the bridges between Limehouse and Wandsworth. So in this case, this particular coal-carrying ship could carry 2,700 tonnes of coal from the northern coalfields to Wandsworth, for them putting on two trucks, I suppose, or, or trains, and unloaded at the Benedict Wharf. I know Wharf sounds like something that should be at the coast, but Wharf also applies to a unloading, unloading area next to a railway line, as seen here on this map from the 1950s. Subsequently, the gas is drawn away by means of a rotary pump, called an exhauster, through a series of condensers, which cool the gas to atmospheric temperature, and in so doing a portion of tar is recovered in the form of the dark, thick liquid which is well known. From the condensers, the gas travels through a series of cast iron or steel rectangular vessels known as scrubbers, where, by washing, the ammonia is released, the final liquid, consisting of water and ammonia, being termed ammoniacal liquor. These byproducts were pretty nasty. The coal tar, until German and British chemists came up with means of extracting colourings for use in dyes, coal tar was either given away or just thrown away. And the ammonia liquid referred to similarly could be used for making fertiliser. It too was just dumped. So, so the land where a gas works was, if it's a particularly old one like the Mitchum works, quite likely quite contaminated. From the scrubbers, the gas passes through a series of cast iron boxes filled with oxide of iron or ferric oxide, which extracts the sulfurated hydrogen. This gas, being a poisonous one, has by law to be totally eliminated from the finished gas. The gas, cleaned and purified, is now ready for use by the consumer and is then metered and stored in the gas holder until required. A question to ask at this point is, what happens to those cast iron boxes filled with oxide of iron, which extracts the hydrogen? What happens when they become saturated? You can no longer extract the hydrogen. One tonne of coal carbonised at a gas works yields coal gas and the following main by-products, which in turn yield many valuable constituents. By distilling chemically the various oils contained in crude coal tar, the following products are obtained dyes, perfumes and essences, explosives, chemicals used in medicine and surgery, such as anaesthetics, antiseptics and disinfectants, aperients, laxatives and emetics, photographic chemicals, wood preservatives, benzol, etc. Which is fine after they discovered how to do this. Prior to that, these byproducts were just dumped. The article goes on to talk about the pollution the cost of soot to the nation is tremendous. Manchester's laundry bill, for instance, is £290,000 a year more than it would be if the air were clean. During heavy fogs, intensified by smoke, traffic is disorganised. In 27 days of fog during recent years, the buses lost 400,000 working miles. 
but the damage which is most obvious to the general public is that done to our buildings. Soot and acid in the air involve the country in an expenditure of about £120,000 a year on the repair of government buildings alone. It is estimated that in London the financial loss due to smoke is nearly £7 million a year. Bear in mind that the figures being given by this newspaper article are from 1933. You could probably add a couple of zeros after each estimate in pounds due to inflation. It also fails to mention that the, the acid falling from the sky in rain, acid rain as it became to be known, was an export industry of the United Kingdom. And the people of Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden and Finland were not too pleased about receiving it. Britain's brightest days in recent years, continued the speaker, were during the coal strike of 1926, when the air became clearer and purer than it has been observed within living memory. The fact is worth recalling, for today of the 33 million tonnes of coal burned in Britain every year for domestic purposes, about 3 million tonnes pollute the air in the form of smoke and soot. Smoke and soot are easily preventable and the responsibility for polluting the air lies with each citizen. By taking advantage of the use of a smokeless fuel, we can individually set an example, and to that extent give the sun a sporting chance of transmitting to us its health-giving rays. It is now a well-established fact that the ultraviolet rays of the sun, which are essential to our well-being, are shut up by the smoke clouds which hover continually over our big cities. On every square mile of our large towns, there is a continuous sootfall, amounting in some cases to an annual deposit of hundreds of tons. The magnitude of the industry may be judged by the following figures. 113,000 people are regularly employed in the gas industry. The capital invested in the industry is about 200 million pounds. 18 million tons of coal are carbonized annually in British gas works. The production of this coal gives employment to about 67,000 mine workers. 10 million consumers regularly use some 1,000 million therms of gas a year. 50,000 miles of mains carry this fuel unfailingly to them. 7 million British housewives cook by gas. Three out of every four doctors all over the country use gas fires. Four out of every five nursing homes and three out of every four hospitals use gas for heating. Altogether, the medical profession accounts for about 100,000 gas fires. 3,000 trades use gas for an average of seven processes in each. The byproducts obtained yearly from British gas works include 12 million tonnes of coke, 120,000 tonnes of sulphate of ammonia, 215 million gallons of tar. Rotarian C. H. Parslow tendered thanks to the speaker for his excellent address and on behalf of the club accepted his kind invitation to visit the works of the gas company. Rotarian Riley Schofield presided, in the absence of the president, Rotarian Isaac H. Wilson, who was attending the Rotary Conference at Scarborough in company with the two vice-presidents, Rotarians Gauntlet and Cole. The Rotarians mentioned at the end of the speech included Riley Schofield. He was borough engineer with the Mitcham Borough Council. Isaac H. Wilson, who gave us the Wilson Hospital, the Cumberland Hospital, which is now the Merton Memory Therapy Centre, the Birches, which is also used by the NHS, and the Mitcham Garden Village. And the two vice presidents who weren't there were Rotarians, Gauntlet and Cole. Cole spelt C-O-L-E, but nonetheless, a bit of irony that someone whose name rhymes with Cole wasn't there for a speech about how coal gas was made. Anyway, very long video. If you got this far, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Press the like button, subscribe, and you'll get more. There's lots more to come. Thank you. Bye.